Jesus Christ, the only way out. The only way out. Whatever you're into, whatever your problem, there is only one way out. Jesus Christ, the only way out. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you come now with unction from on high. Let no one in this house be untouched by the living Word of God. Anoint me, sanctify me, let your power and your glory be upon me. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus Christ, the only way out. Jesus said it, and you remember it, I am the way. And I don't think we have fully understood the power of that proclamation. And I think if we truly, honestly understood the simple statement Jesus made, it could once and for all stop our constant striving and, and sweating trying to please God in flesh. It would end it once and for all. Now, in theory, we believe what Jesus said. We believe and we tell our friends, we tell the sinner, uh, Jesus is your way out of your problem. You've got a drug problem, Jesus is your way. You, you've got a habit, Jesus is the way. You've got a sin problem, Jesus is the way out. We, we say that, and in theory, we uh, believe it. But in practical, everyday experience, very few of us practice it or fully understand it. We are so quick to quote Isaiah and all the prophets about what the Messiah would do when he came. I have preached it on the streets. You have preached it. You have shared it with others. Isaiah said... When Jesus came and the Messiah came, he would come to open the blind eyes. He would bring out the prisoners from the prisons, and them that sit in darkness out of their prison houses, bringing the blind in a way that they knew not, leading them in paths that they have not known yet, making darkness light before them, and crooked things straight. These things he will do, and he will not forsake them. Now we tell the sinner that. You come, Jesus will not forsake you if you repent. He come, he'll give you, uh, he'll open every prison door, every habit, every kind of prison you're in. Then we go on with Isaiah's bold promise that when Messiah comes in acceptable time, he will hear thee. In a day of salvation, uh, uh, salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, that thou mayest say to the prisoner, go forth, to them that are in darkness, show thyself. They shall hunger no more, nor thirst no more. Neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even to the springs of water shall he guide them. Talk about Jesus being the way. Do you really hear what the Spirit is saying through the prophets? Isaiah said, when Jesus Christ comes, he will be the way out of every kind of prison. He'll be the way out of every kind of darkness. He will deliver you from all of your confusion. The way out of all spiritual blindness, the way out of all emptiness, the way out of every habit, every sinful bondage, the way into the light, the way into satisfaction, the way into protection, the way into peace, the way to the very springs of water. Now that's Old Testament, that's from the prophets. Now go with me please to Colossians. Colossians, and I want to show you how Paul brings it into the day of grace. Colossians. First chapter, please, Colossians. If you get to Ephesians, keep turning right. Two more books. If you're in Thessalonians, you're too far. Go left for our new converts. Colossians, the first chapter, beginning to read at verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of what? The body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, 
By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, if, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. Look at me, please. Here in Colossians, the first chapter, Paul's looking back now to the cross. This is not the prophets of the Old Testament looking forward to his coming. He has already come. He has died. His provisions have all been made. It's a finished work. And now Paul said, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. And Paul said, Now he is the head of the body, the church, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Preeminence in Greek means first and foremost. The one you go to, the only one you go to, the first one you go to, you give him preeminence by in midst of trouble, trial, persecution, falling into temptation, whatever trial it is, you go to him and that alone gives him preeminence. That he alone is your source and your resource. Let me tell you what I really believe this means, that all nourishment, all direction, all deliverance, all that we could ever be needing has to flow from him who is the head and the very fullness of God. He ought to be the first one you turn to, the only one you go to when troubles overtake you, sin overcomes you. You do not give Christ the preeminence if you turn to the flesh, if you turn to a friend, if you start wallowing in pity, guilt, sorrow, unbelief. He alone has the preeminence. And by giving him preeminence is simply means to be turning to him first and only, as the only help in your time of need. But sadly, we do not give Jesus preeminence in all things. Let me try to explain to you how most of us react when we face personal discouragement or we have failed the Lord in some way. There's some of you sitting here this morning, sitting under a cloud of failure. You've either sinned against the Lord or there's a habit that you've not yet been able to see uh, victory in. You feel condemned. Some of you have guilt and condemnation as a cloud, a black cloud just hanging over your head this morning. I, I want to speak primarily to those who are passionately in love with Jesus. You want to do His perfect will. Your, your heart is wholly given to Him. Now this doesn't apply to those who are half-hearted. This doesn't apply to those who don't have a passionate love for Jesus. But I'm talking about those who have given themselves wholly to the Lord. Your whole purpose on earth is to live for Him. You say, live or die, I am the Lord's. This world has lost all meaning to you other than to fulfill His purposes, His divine will, His eternal purposes. I want to speak to your heart because the greatest pain and the greatest suffering that a devoted lover of Jesus can ever know is a sense of having failed the Lord having a sense that God may not be pleased with me because I have not lived up to his standards. If you are really devoted to Jesus, you're going to have that kind of a tender heart that anything that clouds your intimacy, anything that would stand between you and him, brings great concern. It brings a, a casting down of your spirit because... You're, you, you feel that there is something standing there that's not been dealt with. I know we're not to live by feelings, but the tender heart toward Jesus can easily be cast down into sorrow. If there's the slightest bit of uh, a loss of that radiant first love, if you feel that your love has grown cold, there's a pain. There's a suffering that goes with that because you have a tender heart toward the Lord. <clears throat> Some of you hearing me right now, you know that Jesus is the way out. 
You've heard it. You've taught it. And in theory, you've believed it. You know that he promised and all the prophets have promised. And here you have it in the New Testament that he's delivered us from the power of darkness. And yet you sit here now and you say, well, Brother Dave, I still have a cloud of darkness over me. I am not living in freedom. I am not, I am not living out what God has promised me. I'm not seeing it. Now, your problem, beloved, is not a wicked heart. You're not a castaway. The problem is not with your failure. It's with your faith. Your failure is in your lack of faith. I want you to hear this now because many of you are living under a false kind of condemnation, guilt, and fear. And I want you to follow me because I believe God wants to set so many people free. As Brother Carter prophesied this morning, that he's going to deliver you from depression. He can deliver you from fear. He can deliver you from all these things that the enemy has put on you. Listen very closely. Perhaps I can best illustrate it by sharing with you this morning some profound dealings of the Holy Spirit in my own life in, in uh, the recent and last uh, probably two months. And the Holy Spirit's been revealing to me some terrible mistakes in my thinking. And, and I want to share it with you, hoping that uh, it'll bring help to you. Now, a lot of people get embarrassed when a shepherd, their shepherd, gets personal and talks about his own struggle because they think it's a sign of weakness often. Or, you know, there are ministers, there are shepherds, there are pastors and evangelists who have you believe they're super saints and never struggle. Don't you believe a bit of it? Don't ever believe that. In fact, Paul was very clear that he shared his struggles and his battles that it would bring comfort to others. He said, Blessed be God who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort or the help wherewith we ourselves have been comforted. And whether we be afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation your salvation. And we know that Paul shared with the whole church body his battle in Asia. He was so overcome, he despaired of life. He said, we would not have you ignorant, brethren. He said, I'm going to tell you our struggles. We would not have you ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure beyond strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. We know that Paul talked about being cast down, but not in despair. We know he talked about his shipwreck, and he talked about all of his battles and his struggles, but he always came out with victory, and... He, cons he insisted that shepherds and leaders go through special trials, and God brings them through a very special hard places that they may find the consolation of the Holy Spirit, that they may be able to work through the struggle and come and tell you how the victory was won, and bring you a victorious report. Now, I can bring you a victorious report. The Lord brought me through my struggle, but He did it through the Word of God and things revealed by the Holy Spirit, so that the comfort I've received I can share with you this morning. It's that very simple. Now, my problem was a feeling that I had lost some anointing, that I was not the fiery preacher I once was. I was a hard preacher, a very hard preacher. And, and in fact, many people on my mailing list wrote and said, I, 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 please drop me from your mailing list, you're too hard. And then when I started, they said, you don't have enough mercy in your preaching. I had people tell me that first two years uh, when I came here to New York, at uh, the beginning of this church, Brother Dave, you, you're sincere, but you're too hard, and you don't have enough mercy, and you scare me. You scare me. One lady said, you scare the daylights out of me. One other person said, I don't think I can ever be saved the way you preach. And... Uh, so when I started preaching mercy, I got letters saying, you've lost the anointing, you're too soft. <laughs> but my real problem was not my preaching. Uh, my real problem was a little deeper than I felt that I had lost my burden for the lost. I didn't have the same intensity of a brokenness and hunger. I, I, I came to New York city as a weeping watchman. I wept all over these streets. And then 
the last few months, the enemy came and said, you're just tired, you're weary, you don't know how to weep anymore. I'd been weeping, but uh, not as intense, been praying, seeking the face of God. There was no backsliding. There was nothing sinful in my life. It's just that the enemy tried to persuade me that, uh, in fact, uh, the really, really got to me. Remember that story in the Bible of the laborer went in the vineyard and he labored and sweated all day and he got the the the, the penny, which is which was a day's wages at the time. Penny was worth probably what many of our dollars are worth. And uh, yet somebody came in at the last hour, worked one hour, and didn't sweat, and got the same pay. Well, basically, I think that's what happened to me. I started seeing some of the converts coming. I, we had a couple graduates coming right out of our uh, Mount Zion Bible School that, that were more, I thought, more devoted than me, were getting greater revelation than I was. And, and they were disciplined. These kids up at five, four and five o'clock in the morning and seeking God all day long. And, and, and uh, they just open a Bible and God reveals things that I didn't know. And I said, God, I'm spending three days and I can't get it. <laughs> there was a cloud uh, came over me, not praying as, as diligently or as much. Uh, and and uh, when that happens, the, 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 there's a sense of boredom or of a weakness the enemy tries to bring into the spirit. And uh, the accusation, you know, the devil's an accuser. Now, don't you tell me you haven't been accused by the devil. In your own mind, not just at the throne of God, but in your own spirit, he'll come and accuse you. that You're not what you once were. You are not as hot as you were. You've cooled off. You're not as effective as you ought to be. I don't know what the enemy's accusing you of, but you've been accused. Now, some of you learn how to handle that. But I want to show you how you can come out of that and totally and be totally victorious. Now, here's what happens. He's the head, and the Bible says we're to hold to the head. And the victory is holding to the head. Holding to the head means holding to a certain truth that God has revealed here in Colossians that's incredible. And I want you to follow me. To, I want to show you what happened. First of all, uh, instead of holding to the head... Holding to Christ by simple childlike faith, we set about to work our own way out. We're going to appease God, and by our own human endeavor, good endeavors, good works, we are going to try to make it up to God, and in some way, we're going to please Him. But the first mistake we made is that we care about an illegal load of guilt, fear, and condemnation. Now, I call it illegal because God didn't give it to you, and God is displeased with it. It's of our own doing, and as long as we carry it, it's an affront and a reproach to the Lord. It's based in nothing but raw unbelief. It's not conviction of the Holy Ghost, and it robs us of serving the Lord in joy and freedom. It's a load of guilt that some of you right now in this congregation, the balcony here on the main floor and around me, you carry... Sometimes you get freedom for a while, but it comes rolling right back on you. You carry guilt and fear and condemnation. You really don't enjoy your Christian walk. It's become a burden to you. You see others around you apparently walking in that freedom, but for you, you can't seem to find it. Now, much of our fear and condemnation comes from a misappropriation of Old Testament truths that do not apply to the day of grace. And folks, you can take yourself back under the old covenant, covenant and do disgrace to the victory of Calvary. Now be very careful in hearing what I have to say now because the key to your freedom is in truth. What is it that sets you free? Truth. You can pray for a year, night and day and not get freedom if you're not praying in faith. You can read this Bible, in fact, all through from page to page, reads it ten times through, and still not get freedom unless the Holy Ghost is revealing Jesus to you in it. There has to be a revelation of what you're reading, and that comes by faith. For example, when I was going through my testing time, uh, I, I, I came across Isaiah 64, 7, and it says, And there is none that calleth upon the name Thy name, there are none that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. 
for thou hast hid thy face from us. You've consumed us because of our iniquities. And that little voice said, ah, there you are. You haven't stirred yourself up as you once were stirred. That's you. You've not been calling on his name as you should. And the Lord is having to hide his face. And that's why you feel a little empty and dry at times. Because the Lord's had it hiding his hiding your face from you, and you don't have the faith, and that's your iniquity, and so uh, you're being consumed inside. That is your scripture. Then I cross-reference that with Micah 3, 4. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, because they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. And then I was directed through cross-reference to Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Have you ever been in a trial and going through some big experience and you go to the Old Testament and you read things like this and you're smitten? I mean, it hits you in the, the gut. And then you hear a voice, see, you're not measuring up to God's holy standard. You have failed the Lord. You've grieved the Holy Ghost. He's been forced to hide his face from you. God's not with you right now. He's not smiling at you. He's waiting for you to straighten up. Mm -hmm. Folks, that's a total misappropriation of Old Testament, Old Covenant truth. Totally misappropriated. And this can happen, and I'll tell you, that's what the devil did when he tempted Jesus. He misquoted, misappropriating uh, uh, half-text, half-truths. Now, I want you to listen to me very, very closely. This is a fear based on ignorance of the New Testament and what Jesus has done since Calvary. It's a misapplication of Old Testament truth. Because the Bible makes it clear that after the Holy Spirit came, after the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, there could be and would not ever again be the hiding of his face for many of his children. No matter what the struggle, no matter what the battle, there would be no hiding of his face. Let me read it to you. I'm reading Ezekiel 39, 29. Ezekiel prophesying of the coming of the Messiah and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Neither will I hide my face any more from them. For I have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. When the Holy Spirit comes, there is no more hiding of his face. I want you to go with me to Isaiah 54, and I want to nail it down. And I want you to, I want you to throw this at the devil every time the devil comes and says, Aha, the Lord has left you, the Holy Ghost has lifted, the Lord has hid his face from you. You stand right up on this, stand to your feet and throw this at him. Isaiah 54. Let's start reading. Verse 4. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy widowhood any more. Now, this is speaking of the Messiah and what he's going to do for his church. For thy maker is thine husband. Who's the maker? Jesus came, didn't he? We're living under this day of the cross. The Lord of hosts is his name. Thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he, he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit. And a wife of youth when thou wast refused, saith God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee. But with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath, I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness. Now, that was the Old Testament, that moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from me, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that hath mercy on thee. Hallelujah. He will not remove his face from you. Listen to me, please. 
Look here. Jesus Christ cannot hide his face from you if you're connected to his body. If you're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh and every joint and every ligament is tied to his body and all of his blood and his resources flow through the body, you, how can he hide his face if you are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? The scripture says, but we all with open face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are changed from glory to glory even by the spirit of the Lord. Colossians, or 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Folks, settled in your heart right now. When Whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle is, I don't care what has happened in your heart. If you reach out in repentance... If you call upon his name, I want you to know that even what you're going through, the hardest struggle, the worst failure, he is not frowning at you. You were reconciled to God when you were still an enemy to the cross of Jesus Christ. When you were an absolute alien, you were reconciled by the cross of Jesus Christ. How much more when you come to him as repentant? How much more when you say, oh God, I've grieved you, I'm sorry. But folks, don't come to him expecting a lashing. Don't come to him expecting judgment. Come expecting nourishment. He nourishes his body. He is not hiding his face from you. Get that in your spirit. He will not hide from you. The Holy Spirit will not be lifted from you. Listen, you say, well, he's got to live in here. What if the enemy comes in and harasses me? The Holy Ghost is not going to stay. Folks, he's got a big job staying with your flesh. He's got to live with your flesh. That that the Bible says is always warring against him. The flesh is always lusting against the Spirit. He doesn't leave you because there's a war. The Holy Ghost is with you. And he battles against the flesh. But in that struggle, in that battle, you do not have a God who turns his face away and say, when you get it right, when you pray enough, read your Bible enough, then come back. He will not hide his face. Paul warned against trying to to fleshly works and sacrifice. I want you to go back to Colossians. Hallelujah. Colossians, the second chapter. Verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. Really means in Greek. Let no man keep defrauding you or beguiling you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. By delighting in self-abasement. Paul called it a delight to abase yourself, to, to bring yourself down. And in other words, in fact, in, in verse 20 to 23, I, I'm reading, uh, the New American Standard brings it out a little clear. Why, as if you're still living in the world, you submit yourself to decrees or rules such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but they're of no value against fleshly indulgence. And here's what it means. And we all do this. I did this trying to bring myself out of the trial that I was going through. I I tried through self-abasement by trying to, to, to bring myself on. And listen, here's, here's what usually happens when, when you're going through a struggle and you're, you're wanting to please God so much and yet you feel that you're not measuring up, that you may have failed God or that you're not praying as you should, your heart may be, you, you say, I'm not on fire, I'm cold, I'm lukewarm, and you're convicted. 
And you're living under this cloud. There's guilt and fear and condemnation. First thing we say, I know what I need. I need to get away. I, I need about two weeks just away from everybody shut in with God. I was going to go to Israel up to Mount Carmel because I thought if I'd go where Elijah prayed, I'd have Elijah's glory. I mean, for a whole month, I, I kept pick, wanting to pick up the phone and get on the plane and go to Mount Carmel. If I can get away, Lord, I need a full week of fasting. I need to make up for more Bible reading. Lord, I'm going to lay hold of you. I'm going to storm the gates of heaven. I'm going to pray so loud that every angel in heaven is going to hear me. I'm not going to, to, to be easy. I'm going to wrestle until I prevail like Jacob did. Now, let me stop here right now, folks. We don't do the prevailing. Jesus already prevailed and won the victory. And I'm not going to fight a battle that's already won. Victory that's been won. You're still trying to prevail on something that's been prevailed over. The devil was defeated at the cross. Uh, you can say, well, I've, I'm, I'm still battling something. I'm going to starve it. I'm going to stomp it. I'm going to beat it. I'm going to come out of this time shut in with God. I'm going to be a new person. Nobody's going to know me. I'm going to be so prayed up, so fasted up, so read up. I'm going to be so devoted, so contrite. I'm going to weep. I'm going to cry. I'll tell you, I'm going to do this at all costs. I'm going to do it. And you see what you're doing? You're not holding to the head. You're not drawing your resources from the Lord. You're saying, if I do this for the Lord, He's got to answer me. If I give him so much time, I read so much scripture, I do this. Folks, that is heathenism. That is trying. Now, these are all good things. We don't pray enough. We don't read this Bible enough. We don't fast enough. These things all are part of, of, of what we need to look at and do more. But, folks, if you do that to try to earn God's favor and blessing, it's of no value. If you try to get your victory over sin by thinking you can fast or simply pray your way out rather than leaning on the victory of the cross of Jesus and the power of His blood, it's all in vain. Absolutely in vain. Paul said it looks good. It appears to be very religious. It appears to be self-control. It appears to be humility. But there's no power in it to break the authority of sin. There's no power in that in itself. If you have turned away from the head, Paul warns if you do all of these self-abasing things while not holding to the head, it's only going to puff you up. He said you can so delight. I'm reading from Second Colossians 2, 18 and 19. You can so delight in self-abasement and not holding fast to the head from which all the body by joints and ligaments having been nourished and ministered to and knit together increases with the increase of God. The only way you increase in the knowledge of God, the only way you increase in holiness, increase in righteousness and in growth is by drawing nourishment from the Father. Hallelujah! How many times I've come into the presence of God and I, I have prayed, Oh God, give me a new anointing. And that's the struggle I had. Oh God, a fresh new anointing. God, give me a fresh touch. Oh God, revive me. Give me more power in my life. Awaken my spirit. God, awaken me. Oh God, a fresh anointing. I have prayed like that and prayed. But folks, that can be nothing but mere works. If you are not understanding what God is saying in Colossians, He said, I'm not looking for self-abasement. Now, prayer becomes self-abasement. Bible reading can become self-abasement. Fasting can become self-abasement. If you are trying to win the approval of God on what you do, I do so much of this, Lord, you're obligated to answer me. And the Lord says, no, I've made every provision. You don't have to have a 
constantly praying, God, give me a fresh anointing. There's a daily supply of nourishment. If you'll just abide in me and like a child trust in me, you have all the anointing. The anointing is in me. The power is in me. The victory is in me. You are in my flesh. You are in my body. You draw constant nourishment from me by just abiding in me. We're to take it by faith. Then I can say, I have lost no anointing because I'm drawing moment by moment nourishment every waking hour of my life. I am being nourished. I am growing. I am increasing in the knowledge of God because I abide in Christ by faith, believing that He is all-sufficient, that He is the fullness of God in Him, and in that fullness I draw it. It's mine. Glory to God. The devil trying to tell you lost something. You just answer back, No, I have been nourished because I'm holding to the head. I'm connected to the head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Paul compliments the Colossians. He didn't compliment them for their praying and fasting and their many good works but for their steadfastness of faith in Jesus Christ as their supply and their resource. He said, For though I am absent from you in flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your discipline and the steadfastness of your faith in Jesus Christ. You are steadfast. You are holding to the head. And the word holding here in, in Greek is using strength and vigor to take it and retain it. And what the devil would want you to, to do is to is somehow fall away from this back into self-abasement where you are always trying to earn God's favor and trying to please Him in your own personal struggles. Folks, it's a wonderful thing when you know that you're safe, when you know you're under the blood, and you know that you're not circumcised by the works of man's hands. In other words, you can't cut off your sin by your own hands. And no preacher can do it. No teacher can do it. But you are circumcised by Jesus Christ and His victory on the cross. He's the only one that cuts off the flesh. You're circumcised by the circumcision without hands. Through Jesus Christ by faith. The devil wants you to forget that and say, well, you can get circumcised if you'll just do all these religious things. Now, folks, if you can come under that kind of freedom and you can see where your victory is and all your resources, then you come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving. You come in then worshiping him. You come with the freedom. Then you can pray for the whole world. You're not stuck on just your own guilt and fear and condemnation. That, that is dispelled through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ revealed by the Holy Ghost and sets you free. I used to come to church sometimes thinking, God, you have to anoint me today. You've got to bless because I spent five hours yesterday praying. God, if ever you, if ever I deserve an anointing, it's today. And I get up and nothing happened. And there are times I've had just a half hour or so before service because of the business lesson, I would sit there and I say, I'll never make it tonight, God. I haven't, I haven't prayed as diligently as I should. And the glory of the Lord comes down. Because the Lord's trying to show my favor, my blessing has already been won. It's not what you do. It's what I've done. Hallelujah. Paul says, fight vigorously to hold this truth that Christ alone is your resource, your only way out. Hallelujah. No more roller coaster rides with Jesus. Up when you feel that you have earned it, down when you think you have failed him. No, steadfast in faith. You that were at one time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith rooted and grounded. Continue not in your good works, but in faith. Now, folks, that's when the good works really count. That's when your prayer is prayed in freedom, unction and anointing. 
I, I would feel awful if my children visited me and were always uptight, wondering if I was ever pleased with them and, 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 and all ill at ease in my presence. I want my children, my grandchildren to come into my presence. I'm the head of the house. I want them to come in and enjoy my presence. I want them to enjoy my love. Some of you haven't enjoyed Jesus at all. You don't know how to rejoice in the freedom, folks. I came into that freedom. I came into that place where laying down, where I don't ever have to worry anymore about whether I have lost something. I don't even have to look into my heart, keep examining where I'm at at this time, because I am standing by faith, being nourished. Folks, do you know that I'm being nourished right now while I'm, being, I'm preaching to you? He's nourishing my spirit. He's nourishing you. His word is nourishing us. Hallelujah. God, help you to lay down that burden, that illegal load of fear and guilt and condemnation. Come to him with a broken, repentant heart and say, Jesus, the best I know my heart, I am sorry. I am passionately in love with you. I want to please you. I want to walk in your perfect will. Bring that kind of spirit and heart to the Lord. And then by simple childlike faith, say, oh, Jesus. I, if I prayed night and day for 20 years, I couldn't earn it. Because you did it on the cross. If, if I read this through 10 times a year and tried to earn your favor through that, I could not get your favor. I could not find peace of heart and the joy of the Holy Ghost. All that I could do to become filthy rags in his sight if I'm not holding the head. I'm holding that truth. And that's the truth that sets me free. Jesus, you're the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything I need in you. You're my only way out from now on. I don't turn to the right or to the left. I keep my eyes focused, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. He's going to finish what he began in you and in me. Will you stand, please? This is the conclusion of the message.